first one that you have is intermittent fasting or time control eating. We've done a lot of episodes on this topic, but tell us about your take or twist that's important for people to know in the context of the new book. Yeah. So number one, uh, because most people don't have metabolic flexibility, most people, when they stop eating or try to extend the time that they don't eat until their first meal, they can't really get to that point because they can't release fats from fat stores. So what I propose uh, in this book is, look, I want to hold your hand and I want to get you to a point where you comfortably only eat from six to eight hours during the day. And what does that look like? Well, I'd like to get you to the place where you eat lunch as break fast, breakfast at around noon or 11 o'clock, and then we'll finish dinner at seven or eight o'clock at night. And that'll give us a six to eight hour eating window. Can I ask one clarifying question about yep. that? So you've talked a little bit about Walter Longo and some of his work and research. One of the things that he's notable for on uh, talking about is that, you know, the communities and the societies where people eat breakfast seem to live longer than the ones who skip so that doesn't have to be a huge breakfast, but eating a little bit because our brain requires sort of energy for focus for this. So is it a societal reason? Well, one, what do you think about that and his conversations in there? And is, two, is it because of societal reasons that you're sort of pushing that timeline backwards so to make sure that people can eat dinner? Because dinner typically is a social thing. Yeah. Um, when I was writing The Energy Paradox, I really wanted to have people eat breakfast and eat lunch and then skip dinner. And I've tried it in the past with patients. I've tried it in the past with myself. And if, if I was going to design the perfect way to do that, that's probably what I would do. But unfortunately, societal reasons, it's completely impractical. Uh, my wife and I you know, mainly see each other at dinner. We both have jobs. And the idea that, you know, we'd come home and then, you know, stare at each other um, and, you know, not do anything. And, and most people have families with kids. And so you start looking at the literature of where breakfast came from. And first of all, uh, hunter-gatherers don't eat breakfast. There is no storage system. They eat breakfast. They break their fast 10, 11 o'clock in the morning when they find something. You look at the history of breakfast, it actually, breakfast started with the Industrial Revolution in England. And men uh, were sent to factories early in the morning. There were no lunch breaks, there were no breaks, and they would come home late at night. So the wives would feed them a breakfast before they left. And the next time they would eat uh, would be after sundown. They actually followed a Ramadan diet. Mm -hmm. um, which is, as I've written about, is actually very effective. Fast forward to the early 1900s when the Kellogg's Corn Flakes Company uh, made a deal with the United Fruit Company, maker of Chiquita Banana, that they would put a coupon for a box of Chiquita Bananas in a box of Kellogg's Corn Flakes, and then they paid physicians to tell people that not only was breakfast the most important meal of the day, but you should top it with a, a banana to get potassium. And bananas aren't a great source of potassium. But So this whole mindset of breakfast being the most important meal of the day is really a very modern concept from the late 1800s. For and, sure. Yeah. And I think also Walter Longer was talking about like not people eating this big American industrialized breakfast, but rather... Like it might be a little bit of prosciutto, some cheese, other things that right. somebody might have. And it might be more around like 10 a.m. or whatever, but not necessarily waiting till lunch in America is usually 1230, one o'clock, sometimes two. You, you have a meeting, you skip lunch, and it starts later. And to Walter's credit, uh, when I give him credit in the book, recently he's shown that if you eat a primarily nut bar, and it's called the fast bar, um, that it will not take you out of ketosis. And I've used that trick actually in my program of having people who really need some help 
getting towards noon, just have a handful of nuts or, as we'll talk about in a minute, hopefully have some MCT oil or have a piece of goat or sheep cheese or have some goat yogurt or goat uh, or sheep yogurt. And you won't break your fast for a really fascinating reason. You know, you work with people from all different backgrounds, shapes and sizes and everything like that as patients. One of the conversations that's been pretty prevalent and been integrated in a lot of practitioners' uh, sort of recommendations is that do there need to be different fasting recommendations for women in their prime fertility years? Absolutely. And do you at all tweak your intermittent fasting approach for those, uh, for, for exactly that, women in their prime fertility years? Yeah. And um, I actually work with a lot of uh, women athletes who can't get pregnant. And it's fascinating that they have a very low, you know, body fat percentage. And we have a, women have a fantastic sensing apparatus. Uh, you have to have adequate fat stores to go nine months without eating to actually pop an egg out to risk an, an egg getting fertilized. And so you have to have fat stores that if the famine happened tomorrow and you're pregnant, you can carry that baby to term. Uh, the best example is orangutans. Uh, orangutans, uh, during fruit season, gain seven to eight pounds of weight in fat, eating fruit. Uh, keep remembering that uh, eating fruit makes you fat, but that's another story. Uh, <laughs> but all great apes store fruit as fat. So the orangutan, the female orangutan, doesn't go into heat until after she's gained that seven to eight pounds, and then she pops her egg out. And so I see so many females in my practice, if I can forcibly get, make them gain 10 pounds, the next thing I go, hey, you know, thanks, I'm pregnant. Um, and in fact, many of these women stop ovulating. And I just actually had a young lady, an athlete, in a couple of weeks ago. And she said, uh, you know, it's, it's really weird. You know, I'm only 35 years old and I'm in menopause. And I go, what do you mean? And she said, well, I haven't had a period in a year now. And, you know, I've, I've been using, a, you know, a ketogenic fasting diet. I really limit, you know, my eating window. And so I do female hormones on everybody and male hormones on male. And I said, well, that's interesting. You're not in menopause. You, your follicle stimulating hormone is incredibly low. And if you were in menopause, it'd be incredibly high. And you're still producing estrogen, but it's not much. I said, you're not in menopause. You've told your body to stop popping out eggs because you're a bad risk. And she said, really? And mm. I, said, well, I said, well, it's right here. And she said, well, that's good news. You know, I thought I was in menopause. And I said, no, but, you know. So if you don't want to get pregnant, then this is a perfect option for you and no problem. She's 35. She has two kids. And she said, Oh, I just thought I was in menopause, but this uh, it was a perfect example. <laughs> yeah, you see it a lot. Uh, I had a, a girlfriend many years ago who was, you know, vegan for years, but was a low fat vegan, and uh, stopped having her period. And uh, when she finally started having and um, and kind of discovered the world of uh, uh, Flow Living, which is a, a author out of New York, Alyssa Vitti. And uh, she started including eggs in her diet and other things that were beneficial. She still was vegetarian, yeah. but she was having eggs and things. Boom, immediately started to get her period back, which is just shows you the power of you know not removing fats from your diet. That's true. That's true. So how would you adjust your eating window for anybody who's a woman, again, in their prime fertility years who wants to step into the, the keto program that you've aligned? Well, the good news is, or the bad news is, the vast majority of us in the United States are metabolically inflexible. And so many people are pre-diabetics uh, without knowing it. And so, so many women are going to enter pregnancy with, you know, two hands tied behind their back because, you know, we see so much uh, diabetes of pregnancy now. And I can tell you that this puts, you know, your baby and not only you 
under extreme risk. Um, so for for women who are overweight or obese, absolutely, let's you know get you on a intermittent fasting program. Let's get your insulin levels down. Let's you know uncouple your mitochondria. Let's get you metabolically flexible, and then uh, you'll be ready. Uh, it's it's you know it's like training for anything else. Um, and then if you're on the flip side, because you have a lot of people that come to you that have actually been eating very healthy for for years, and maybe their fasting insulin is not in the op, in the right area, maybe their sugar is a little bit high, but right. you look at them, they're they maybe even look a little underweight, right? Right. So yeah. for those individuals, would you say that? Okay, let's not focus on necessarily the the traditional time restricted eating window. Correct. Let's just dial in the 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 rest of the factors that are there. Exactly, and we see like uh, the woman who starts my book. Uh, this woman, once we kind of dialed in all these uncoupling compounds that she was eating, the weight kept falling off of her, and even though she was no longer eating a traditional ketogenic diet. And for her, believe it or not, we she got to be a real carbohydrate eating fiend as long as they were the right carbohydrates, and so she was really happy with her keto, my ketogenic version of her diet. That's great because that's a super important thing for people who are listening. Again, if you've had one belief of what keto is, I think you're going to really like this program because there's a lot of foods that you can have yeah. that previously you didn't think that you could have. Correct before. If you found this video helpful, I think you're gonna love this one. But I'm here to share with you that we should eat short to live long. What do I mean by that? In other words, compressing our eating window, the foods we eat during the day, it's not so important the types of foods that we're eating, and I'll get to that in a minute, 